Good evening, everyone. Hello, and welcome to tonight's program, which is brought to you by Kensington, Chelsea, and Westminster Libraries. Tonight's event is presented as a part of our annual literary festival, which is put on to celebrate a large collection of books and other materials on subjects of customs and folklore, which are held at Kensington Central Library. To give you a bit of background about this collection, in the 1960s and 70s, London libraries collaborated to create a remarkable London-wide net, which would cover diff different areas of the Dewey Decimal System. And Kensington Central Library had 920s, which is biographies, and 390s, which stands for folklore and customs, as its specialist subjects. Um, and although um, the local authorities have given up um, the idea of these mega uh, collections. Some library authorities like ours still retain and proudly promote their special collections. Um, so our, um, this festival is currently in its sixth year and we put it on in order to uh, promote this wonderful collection um, to all of you lovely people out there. Um, it's, we hope that some of you might have joined us. This is, we are exactly halfway through our festival. Um, we hope to regale, that we are regaling you with some enlightening, engaging, and sometimes wonderfully quirky talks like the one we had last night um, from a Bobby on the Beat in uh, an area of London. Um, the subjects themselves, folklore and customs, they provide rich pickings um, when it comes to, to both quirky and enlightening, I think. The co collection covers a variety of topics that range from manners, etiquette, different customs related to food, birth, sex, marriages, funeral rites, urban legends, rural tales, books of fairies, and books of days, all the way to witchcraft and esoteric ideas. A large sequence covers a family of tales, uh, which includes fairy tales, folk tales, myths, legends, and so on from across the globe. So tonight our guest is our Roman envoy, our favorite Roman envoy, Olga Tuchkovich, with an open air archeology span of Rome um, a session that will hopefully show us a bit of how, uh, um, tell us a, a bit about how ancient Romans lived their lives and will touch on some of their customs um, and, and will um, tell us how they lived and how they still live in Rome. Um, Olga is a good friend of our program. Um, this is probably a sixth or seventh talk she's doing for us. Um, she's a licensed tour guide of Rome and Vatican City. She's managed tours in Italy, Central Europe, Croatia and Bosnia for over 30 years um, and is um, has worked for one of the best US tour operators as coordinator and guide. She specializes in private tours for families and in individual custom made itineraries and a lover of art, she has obtained her master's degree in arts management at the American University of Rome a couple of years ago. So it's a great pleasure to welcome again and introduce to you our Roman envoy, Olga Chuchkovic. Welcome, Olga. Well, hello, Nina, and uh, hello, everyone. Or should I say, buonasera from Rome. And uh, as uh, Nina announced uh, tonight, We'll be talking about the archaeology in Rome, mainly open air. I will uh, mention also a few museums that focus on archaeology and that can teach us uh, a lot about how people uh, used to live. So um, almost everyone has heard that comparison of Rome or like a metaphor that Rome is like a historical uh, lasagna. And it, it really is. I mean, there are like 3000 years uh, of history and, uh, and layers. And uh, whenever you start building something in Rome, of course, you have to start digging a little bit and uh, inevitably you run into something. So it can go through any given century in any given neighborhood. But uh, let's start from somewhere. This. Um, uh, thumbnail photo is the ancient Roman Forum, and of course, uh, we'll be 
coming back to it. It's at the very heart of Rome and um, it was the hub of social, religious, political life in Rome with the temples of the various divinities to whom Romans were uh, devout. Uh, there were the basilicas, which were the sort of a courthouses, the term Basilica is a bit confusing because it has uh, several meanings. It comes from the Greek basileo, which uh, means the king, and on behalf of the king or the authority, basilica was a public building. And eventually it finds its way into the Christianity and many Catholic churches have the title basilica at that point. But we talked a lot about uh, Catholic churches as basilicas in uh, other presentations about pilgrims in Rome and the churches in Rome. But now um, let me show you where we will be going. This is the city of Rome. This is already sort of a center of Rome where approximately 1 million people live. And uh, we can see here inside this circle, sorry, let me go back, inside this circle, uh, this is, for example, I hope you can see my laser. If not, uh, please let me know. Uh, this is the Termini railway station, the central railway station. And uh, uh, here is the Colosseum, where there is the big uh, M that is the sign for the metro stop. And ancient Roman Forum is right here in the very center of the center. We'll start with the little island in the middle of the river of Tiber, Isola Tiberina or Tiber Island. We will not be dedicating time to the Vatican city state. Yes, they do have, of course, historical uh, excavations, but they're not uh, um, clearly visible in the open air. You can go, for example, visit the excavations uh, under the Basilica of St. Peter's called Scavi, but that has to be reserved way ahead uh, and since the number of the visitors are limited it's, it's not that easy and of course the photos are not allowed so I have skipped uh, skipped that part so um let's say okay once again Hi, here is the Olga can, yes. I just, can I just interrupt to say that um I don't think it's a huge problem but your um laser pointer isn't showing oh it's not so, showing okay so um, I'll be so using uh, I can see your cursor now Okay, oh, you'll be using the cursor. Um, yeah, I, I, I can I see that. I think yeah. it, used, it used to work, maybe it doesn't anymore. Things happen. Yeah. So let me just uh, very briefly. So here is the Termini railway station. Can you see it now? Where I'm pointing these lines to the right inside the blue circle. And then the Colosseum here in the very center and ancient Roman Forum. So we will be concentrated a lot uh, uh, there, but we'll be visiting the island in the middle of the river. And then uh, um, with some videos, I'll try to give you some orientation. We will uh, also uh, touch a little bit the Castel Sant'Angelo, Castle of the Angel, the bridge uh, that was built originally in the second century. So this is the very heart of Rome that we are uh, visiting. Now, let me start with uh, the island, as I mentioned, Isola Tiberina, the island of uh, Tiber. There was like a ridge of alluvial sand and uh, that was the easiest uh, point on the river of Tiber to cross it between uh, Etruria and the Southern Italic tribes. So wherever you could really safely build a little bridge uh, or something to cross the river, that is where the cities have actually developed. And uh, the importance of the bridges is reflected in the terminology that we still use today. In the past, uh, the pontifex was the high priest in ancient Rome, but also we address the Pope as the pontifex maximus. So again, the high priest and the pon, il ponte is the, is the bridge and pontifex, probably in origin, the etymology would be the bridge making. Now, the island uh, of Tiber, Isola Tiberina, has uh, two bridges that's still, of course, connected with both sides of the river. And there is one broken uh, bridge that uh, broke twice the, after the second time the Romans gave up building the, the bridge there, because that is where the two streams meet and they're quite violent uh, in the flooding season. So the bridges in Rome, I'll point out again with my cursor, 
uh, would have these openings that would release the pressure of the water as it went uh, through the bridge. Imagine it does it does get that high, uh, hopefully, hopefully or luckily, uh, not not that not that frequently, but it can happen. And uh, the island shows uh, the construction technique here at the bottom. You see these uh, big blocks, squared blocks. They are set in sort of a parallel courses. And uh, uh, they recreated a prow of an uh, ancient uh, trireme, the kind of a, of a boat. It's all connected with old legends of, uh, of Rome. But let me just uh, show you something because we have so, so much to cover. So I'll try to show you as much as possible. What I wanted to really point out is um, on this wall, if you look at the bottom and I'll get uh, um, closer to it, there is a little snake uh, around uh, um, a rod. That is the rod of Asclepius, uh, uh, the god of uh, medicine. There were these uh, temples dedicated to Asclepius, Asclepeions uh, in the Greek world, in ancient Roman world where people would come for the healing. And uh, um, surprisingly enough, the healing would frequently consist in a sort of detox of, of, of a sort, dietary changes, uh, rest. Uh, they would uh, go to a special area where they sleep and then um, their dreams were interpreted by the, by the priests uh, and then the, usually dietary changes were uh, suggested but of course Romans had surgeons uh, they had a lot of head galen galen uh, the, um, the medical doctor who gave us the base for the for the medicine in the in the future then the Hippocrates is Greek a lot was based on the on the Greek medicine and um, and Greek doctors and uh, uh, Hippocrates himself seems to have started in the temple of uh, Asclepius so that is still the symbol on the on the pharmacies, the Greek god of uh, of medicine. Now there's still the hospital on the island called uh, Fatte Bene Fratelli, Do Good Brothers. It was a religious it is a religious uh, order, but uh, there's been a hospital there since uh, 1548, continuing the the tradition that started in the third century BC with the temple of uh, Asclepius, and. Uh, Thus, across the river, towards the very center, towards the Roman Forum and the Colosseum, there's this area known as the area of the Sant Omobono, the holy the saint Omobono. He's the patron saint of the, of the tailors. And uh, uh, this area is the most uh, complicated archaeological area in uh, Rome because uh, it was revealed the way you see it in 1937 and uh, underneath they found the, the Greek pottery from 8th century BC. They have uh, found an archaic temple, then two temples from the, from the 6th century. Some of the remains are in the Capitoline museums. Uh, there was a Porta Triumphalis here, the um, triumphal, triumphal gate, which really does not exist uh, anymore. So much does not, uh, does not exist. And in this neighborhood, there, was, there were two markets, uh, the market for the cattle and the market for vegetables. And of course, the river right there, it was much closer. It was almost all the way to the church today. And when they did the excavations recently for this first archaic temple, uh, they had to dig all the way down like in, in trenches because it's below the, uh, the riverbed today. And, um, the markets were so so interesting it would be great to be able to go back in time and uh, and see what was going on so the cattle market uh, yes of course there was a regular kind of cattle that that we all know but for example something that wasn't um that's not really acceptable uh, today so much uh, is the dormice they would uh, uh, fatten them in clay jars with little uh, holes so they could pour things they could breathe and they would have like uh, little like little steps or something for the for the exercise of a sort and they were the, the specialty uh, poor dormice and um, they were also selling monkeys whether for um, entertainment or for some other kinds of specialties so some things were not what we would accept uh, uh, today. 
but we can learn a lot about what Romans uh, ate. For example, the mosaics. This is a beautiful mosaic that is in the Vatican museums. It's the motif that's known as the unswept floor because when Romans had uh, banquets, normally they, during the day for regular meals, they would sit at the table and they had chairs. But for the banquets, uh, they would be in those three cliniums uh, or three sided um, area, three sided rooms uh, where they would uh, uh, lean usually on their left elbow and eat with their right hand. And for us, it would be very unusual, but actually some research has shown that the digestion actually works quite, quite well when you do it in, in that kind of a position. And uh, there's a lot of stories about these banquets and how they used to vomit and they eat again. Of course, we're talking about the, the very privileged class. So uh, we can see here, again, I'll use my cursor. You see there's a little sea urchin. And if you read um, the books about what they would really serve as specialties, uh, there are the, um, the, the, the pig's teeth, others uh, stuffed with the uh, salted sea urchins. They believe that combining two different flavors would create a third one that could be extraordinary. And uh, um, then a lot of snails, uh, oysters, they, they ate a lot of uh, fish as well, but obviously I'm talking about the rich people because fish costed three times more than, uh, than the meat because of the transport and uh, how bad it would go soon unless you salted it. That's why salt was so, uh, so precious. And um, here you can see a close by, I just find this um, mosaic. Uh, fascinating and also how they already use, if you look at these little uh, uh, seashell uh, here, you can see the chiaroscuro, actually chiaroscuro, light dark to create the volume, is the Renaissance name for an ancient technique uh, it's called skyography or skiagraphia, in invented by a Greek painter, Apollodorus in the 5th century BC, so they, um, they had that. And uh, also at the Vatican Museums, there's this beautiful mosaic from an excavation site in, in Rome called the uh, Tor Marancia. You can see a uh, mm, chicken here without feathers already, uh, several kinds of fish, uh, shrimp that were a specialty, then dates. Uh, they were using a lot of dried fruit because it was easier to, of course, uh, preserve, and uh, asparagus. So we can see some, they ate a lot of things that uh, we would normally eat. Of course, they did not have the, um, the potatoes or corn or tomatoes uh, yet, uh, because that would come with the discovery of the, of the new world. And uh, in the vicinity of these um, markets, there was this really important temple, the oldest marble temple, second century BC, redone later many times, called the Temple of uh, Vesta, but it was actually Temple of Hercules. It's lovely to, to walk around at night. Some of these monuments are beautifully lit. And I'll be getting back to uh, the cult of the Vestal Virgins because uh, the most important uh, temple of Vesta is in the ancient Roman Forum. This one is wrongly called Vesta because of its uh, round shape, but it was again, actually dedicated to, uh, to Hercules. And now to go where it all started, we go to the Palatine Hill, Palatino. This is where, according to uh, the legends, to the myth, uh, Romulus uh, founded the first settlement and he killed his brother Remus. And uh, the archeological excavations have actually confirmed the, the myth and not really that it was maybe somebody whose name was Romulus, but th that it really dates back to, to that time. It's like a vast archeological uh, maze in a continuous sequence since uh, 9th century BC, because there were the, the Greek colonies, there were Italic tribes. Uh, we know about the foundation of Rome, but uh, not that the people did not uh, live here before that. And um, so reportedly, this would be the dwelling place uh, of the legendary uh, founder and uh, uh, the politics of Emperor Augustus, the first Roman Emperor uh, actually 
were demonstrated here because he built his dwellings right next to what was uh, um, believed, or he maybe created that belief that that was the hut of, of Romulus very conveniently. He was born on the Palatine Hill himself. And um, uh, building your dwelling next to where the legendary founder lived uh, and uh, where these uh, uh, twins, Romulus and Remus, were saved by, by a she-wolf, that reinforces your position as, uh, as an emperor. Imperium meant some sort of authority. And um, in the vicinity, just across the little street, there is a house that's known as the House of Livia, who was the, the wife of uh, uh, Emperor Augustus, probably erroneously uh, attributed to the House of Livia because of the inscriptions. You see here on the wall to the left, there are these uh, three sort of conduits and they contain the, the name Julia Augusta, which could have been Livia, could have been Julia, the daughter of Titus. Uh, because of the vicinity to the house of Augustus, it's commonly known as the house of, uh, of Livia. But I wanted to tell you about these conduits because the um, Romans had right to public supply of water. There were uh, hundreds, there were more than 1,000 fountains. Uh, there were 11 major um, imperial baths, public baths, and we'll be, we'll be getting back to them. There were private baths, but only for the, for the rich. So water was in abundance because of their aqueducts. But uh, privately, it's, it wasn't granted. It was a privilege that you obtained from the emperor or you paid your way through it. But to have your own supply of water was a huge privilege. You can see a lot of that in, um, in Pompeii. A lot of the, of the conduits were, were preserved. And as Augustus started, other um, emperors followed. So this is the, um, the remains of the so-called Domus Flavia, or the house of the palace of uh, Vespasian Titus Domitian, the emperors uh, who were involved with building of the Colosseum. Uh, in the first century, second half of the first century. And when Rome fell, um, this was abandoned and uh, the scale was abandoned. And in the sixth century, the, the aqueducts were cut during uh, one of the incursions of the, of the Goths. So without the water supply, there was an aqueduct that brought water to, uh, to the hill of Palatine. Uh, it, was so, it was first again abandoned, the vegetation takes over. But eventually it becomes uh, a playground of the, of the wealthy. And uh, we see here the so-called uh, Loggia Farnese. Farnese was the family that had a Pope in the family, Paul III, the one responsible for the last judgment in the Sistine Chapel. And uh, he had his uh, Orti or hort, Horti, the, the gardens uh, with the beautiful, beautiful buildings full of works of art, uh, a lot of, Building material from ancient Roman time was recycled, also taken to Parma because the Farnese were the dukes of uh, Parma as well. And if you're wondering what is this now, this is a 16th century. That was the well, the Pope's um, birdcage for exotic birds. And that's what you would see if you approached the Palatine from the ancient Roman Forum. So you come up to the Palatine, a lot of things have, have changed. It would be a very long story about um, how many changes have taken place uh, throughout the centuries. But now you come up to the Palatine for a lovely view. And uh, we're going to talk about the ancient Roman Forum. So that is the, the view that we have now as we climb to the Palatine Hill. So you can start here to the left uh, where there is the building with the bell tower, that's the Capitol Hill. Then. There are the triumphal arches, three triumphal arches. We're going to see all three of them. This is Septimius Severus, uh, third century triumphal arch. Then uh, the columns of the temples. Unfortunately, of the basilicas, now I'm pointing uh, down below the bell tower, there is a big uh, uh, area that was uh, Basilica Iulia, another courthouse built originally by Julius Caesar. Then the big square building right in the center, that was Curia, the, the building of the Senate. And then going more to the right, you see a temple with a church in it. We'll get back to it. 
Now I'd like to show you just a few details then, the arch of uh, Septimius Severus, third century, and then the churches around it. There's a church of St. Luca and Martina built on top of ancient Roman ruins. And uh, also here where they're still doing the excavations, the, there would be the remains of the famous Lapis Niger or the, the Black Stone. That was probably a temple to volcano, but uh, uh, we um, have this tradition that this is where Romulus was buried or ascended to heaven and all these. And if anybody ever touches uh, this um, shrine, something really bad will happen to that person and, and then to Rome as well. We love superstitions. And uh, inside the, the forum, there's this tiny little temple that's a total reconstruction of the 1920s. And you see, for example, here at the bottom, there is this round structure that seems like a well, but actually it's connected with the excavations and the stratigraphic marks that the archaeologists uh, um, leave after they have worked in that, uh, in that area. Now, the Vestal Virgins were chosen from the, from the best Roman families, uh, girls aged uh, six to 10, usually. They would make a vow that they would remain virgins for 30 years. And then they could get married or stay in the, in the temple and help the young generation of the, of the Vestal Virgins. If they broke that vow, the gentleman who, well, helped them change the status would be stoned to death and poor girls were buried alive because they were considered fundamental for security of Rome uh, uh, and they were in charge of the holy flame and if they were no longer pure, something really bad could happen to, to Rome. So poor things were, well, actually buried alive. And still today, you see that area where the cemetery was, where they were buried, was known as the Campus Sceleratus. And still today, there is a, an ugly word for a girl that's not such a good girl. And it comes from Campus Sceleratus. We would say ragazza scelerata. So um, that's very irrespectful, it's not a bad word in itself, but Shelerata, it comes from Vestal Virgins who, well, broke, they, broke their wealth. And uh, just two steps from the Vestal Virgins um, temple, there, there is the uh, altar dedicated to the first man to be deified, Julius Caesar. And uh, you remember one of Shakespeare's uh, friends, uh, Romans countrymen, uh, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar and I must pause till it come back to me. I'm reading this. And uh, people still bring flowers to Julius Caesar for some reason. Now, mm, he was not buried here. Uh, he was cremated because uh, it was either cremation or inhumation. Uh, later on with the Christianity, inhumation prevails and uh, mm, it was not allowed to bury anyone within the city of, of Rome because of diseases and also because of the superstitions romans um, did not like to be very close to the to the dead but they would bring them uh, gifts in the forms of, of form of lib so-called libations and they would respect the dead uh, very much now this is the government building in ancient rome but also in the middle ages the building of the senate i'm talking about this huge building with the with the bell tower but now we're going to look at it from the other side. It's like a double-faced uh, hill where you can see that it's now it's to the right. It was designed by, by Michelangelo. The way it looks on this side, it's right next to the big Vittoriano monument, the center of Rome, Piazza Venezia. And um, when you climb the Capitol Hill, you meet uh, Marcus Aurelius on the, on the horse the only equestrian statue that survives in Rome because bronze was melted down for weapons and utensils in the Middle Ages, obviously. And uh, now back to the forum, it was possible to build things in the forum only after the first big sewer was built in the sixth century BC, Cloaca Maxima or the Great Sewer, because some of the three of the seven kings of Rome before the Republic, before the empire, uh, they were Etruscan, and Etruscans knew how to build the, the drains. So this is one of the entrances, it's not open to public. So people would come to the forum for these uh, social purposes, to attend the court uh, the trials, uh, watch the gladiator games, uh, 
uh, meet other other Romans, always citizens and always men, obviously, hear the news, um, perform religious uh, services, watch the triumphal processions after major conquests, and play some games. While they were waiting for their trial of interest, uh, there are plenty of these so-called tabula lusoria, like the board game, game board, etched into the steps of Basilica Iulia. They would play with little pebbles, but also with, uh, with dice. And you can see one of those dices uh, uh, was a counterfeit. You put a little lead in it and it falls more frequently on the number that you want. So we didn't invent, any, we haven't invented anything. <clears throat> so here, one of the roads in the, in the forum, Romans were famous for aqueducts, for drains, for, for roads, uh, and they were recomposed the best they could where you see the grooves of where the carriages used to pass. But to really see the Roman roads as they were, you have to go to Pompeii. So I will have just a few photos from, from Pompeii. You see how they would jump on these rocks to not uh, wet their feet into all kinds of well dirt that could have been on the street as well. And then you see these groups of the carriages that left their trace uh, in the basalt rock. Now again, back to the forum. So to see the other side, uh, again, the, the temple of uh, Antoninus Pius uh, with church built inside of it. And then to the right, you see the building with huge arches. It's only one wing of it that survives. It's the so-called Basilica of Maxentius, later of Constantine. Again, a courthouse, a public building. We end up with the Colosseum at the far end. We are up on the Palatine. Down below the Colosseum, there's the Arch of uh, Titus. We'll get to it. And um, then, we go to the temple again of Antoninus Pius to see a little bit better how it looks like. The stairs that you see leading up to the temple are modern, so ignore them if you would like to ignore modern things. The church of uh, Saint Miranda built within the temple. Antoninus Pius was the emperor in the second century. Emperors were considered to be divinities and their families too. And um, at the top of the columns, you can see these grooves that I'm again pointing with my cursor. The grooves that mm, there's the urban legend that people try to pull them down as they did with a lot of building material and the columns, but probably those are the, um, uh, the grooves from the makeshift roofs in the Middle Ages. We really don't have the certainty, we're just trying to, to guess. Uh, that basilica that I just mentioned uh, is the last uh, one that was built and uh, the largest. It inspired the arches of St. Peter's Basilica at the, at the Vatican, the Renaissance architects. Now the Arch of Titus is an honorific arch uh, and dedicated to the, to the emperor that celebrates, uh, you see Roman celebrations usually brought disasters on someone else. Here is the bringing of the spoils of Jerusalem from the, from the temple, from the great temple. You see how uh, Romans are pushing the prisoners from Jerusalem and carrying the menorah from the temple, entering the city of, uh, of Rome, the beginning, the, seven, the year 70 AD, the beginning of the diaspora for the Jewish population of the Holy Land. And uh, this arch was masterfully restored in the 1800s, but you see how the foundations are left uh, visible and they're not black and white uh, for any fashionable reason. They are uh, revealed because they had to decide down to which level they're going to excavate. But uh, uh, the change in material indicates that that makes uh, uh, structurally the foundations more elastic and uh, the whole arch more, more stable. So they're mixing basalt and limestone. Now on the other side of the Palatine, there's the Circus Maximus that was used uh, for chariot races and uh, Roman religious festivals, public games. Uh, charioteers were the wealthiest of the, um, of the sportsmen, wealthier than the, than the gladiators. And uh, it's, it was much deeper, some five meters or 15 feet than what you see today. And it is a monumental area in itself. It's not allowed to build anything on it. We are now on the side of the Aventi. And 
Talking about ancient Rome, where it all started, seven hills of Rome, we are now at the main railway station. And as you enter the railway station, you see these ancient blocks. That was the wall called, um, called the Servian Wall, uh, laid out in the sixth century BC, built in the fourth century BC, surrounding Rome and the, and the seven hills for defense. But then for centuries, it wasn't necessary to build anything uh, like that. You see right outside of the Termini railway station in the third century, yes, because of the barbarian invasions. This is the third century wall, so-called Aurelian walls. Uh, and uh, they go around 13 miles or 19 kilometers around Rome and uh, two thirds of that wall still survive. This is a very elegant neighborhood of Rome. And Rome being so um, like a melting pot of so many different uh, nationalities, uh, ethnic groups, uh, they picked up this and that from different civilizations. And uh, this pyramid is a tomb of a magistrate, uh, Gaius Cestius, and it goes back to the first century BC. And um, the first emperor was Augustus. And uh, here I took a little video of the mausoleum, the burial site of Emperor Augustus uh, as it was under the restoration and look how that statue is changing colors because, uh, well, they were colored and this statue is in the Vatican Museums. But this mausoleum is now open for visits finally and across from the mausoleum there's this very modern building. See, when we're talking about the historical lasagna, inside this building, there is uh, an altar called Ara Pacis, the altar of peace. And I have a very old photo of it from 2014. You see how this is a huge altar. And this was a special occasion, the celebration of 2000 years of the death of Augustus, the first emperor. And uh, it was, um, recre they recreated with laser lights the way it looked like. It was all colored like that statue that you saw outside. So that's how it looked like during the, the restorations. The crane is still there, but um, I was there recently with, with a colleague and an archeologist and it's really exciting. So much more is um, opening in Rome. So this was the mausoleum where the members of the Imperial family were buried for a couple of centuries. And then um, Emperor Hadrian, built what is known today as uh, Castel Sant'Angelo. Again, this was outside of the so-called uh, Pomerium. Pomerium was the sacred uh, um, border of the city, very well determined and extending a couple of times in the history of ancient Rome, but it wasn't it's, uh, really strictly forbidden to bury anyone within, except the Vestal Virgins, there could have been an exception. And uh, uh, how did Augustus come into power? He had uh, um, he was adopted by his uh, um, uncle, and uh, he was his second cousin and nephew. And uh, uh, Caesar Julius Caesar extended the ancient Roman Forum. Here it is, right by the center of Rome, the uh, Piazza Piazza Venezia. But we always mention Julius Caesar so much because probably we mention. Uh, proverbial uh, uh, bad boys uh, more often than, than the good ones. Well, he was a good and a bad, but uh, definitely one of the most famous personalities. And uh, to um, maybe disappoint some of you, he was not assassinated in the ancient Roman Forum. He was assassinated after the se session of a Senate, but not there, but here, Largo di Torre Argentina, in the 1920s, the demolitions revealed uh, the four temples in the very center of Rome. And uh, uh, the building of the Curia was built by Julius Caesar after a big fire, the old one was uh, damaged. And the Senate was meeting uh, in the temple of Venus that was part uh, of, the, um, sec of the section of town built by Pompey, who was with him in the triumvirate. And if you believe what the guides say, well, Caesar was assassinated somewhere around this tree that nobody can really say for sure, but some plaques were found recently. So uh, it seems that that story has been confirmed. And right next to that um, area, there, is, there are these buildings that are 
curved because they follow the shape of what used to be the theater of Pompey and they reveal the urban planning of the past. So you walk around and find some strangely shaped building. It's actually following, you see here on this map, this is an ancient map from the uh, third century of which uh, about 10, 15% is uh, preserved and it's kept in these archaeological museums. This is Crypta Balbi. So I have written that here in the corner to the left, one of the four locations where you can see the history of, uh, of Rome through archaeology. And uh, this Crypta Balbi is really extraordinary. You have a lot of Middle Ages and uh, really follows uh, what happened to this whole, whole urban setting uh, throughout um, Dark Ages too, because Rome was reduced to maybe 30,000 from more than 1 million. So what was really happening? They were burning down those marble monuments to obtain the quick line. And we are in the very heart of Rome and uh, where you see these trees, the sycamore trees, uh, that's the river of Tiber. We are looking at the big great synagogue to the, to the right, the new Jewish ghetto. And um, the building in the center, the Teatro Marcello is from the first century BC, completed in the first century AD. And um, people lived on, on top in the Middle Ages and today some really privileged properties inside this theater, namely the embassy of the um, Knights of Malta to the Vatican. So really, really prestigious. Real estate, if you have your little guide in Rome, then show you these little secret, well, they're not secret passageways from which you can have beautiful views. We are back to the uh, markets, ancient markets. And you see how Rome, again, archeologically grew on top. You see this lovely little church was built within a couple of temples. There were three temples there. There was the market, uh, uh, vegetable market. And uh, this little church now, St. Nicholas. And uh, again, in the very heart of Rome, when Rome becomes the, the empire, then the forum extends. And here we are in Via dei Fori Imperiali. You see straight ahead is the Colosseum. So I'm trying to make a whole circle to show you where all these things are. So the Colosseum, the uh, ancient Roman empire. Then to the right is the neighborhood called Monti. And then the very center of Rome, uh, Piazza Venezia, Victor Emmanuel Monument. And you can see the traces uh, of excavations uh, everywhere. This is now the view of the same area from the, from the Capitol Hill. And we are looking at the big modern road that was uh, laid out by Mussolini. He knocked down a whole neighborhood in order to create this, uh, this street for his military parades. His intention was to reach the, the imperial level because he wanted to reinforce his propaganda of himself being a, a new, new emperor. And uh, when he did that, a lot of little people's homes were revealed. You see these um, tiles, some of these um, kitchen tiles in the middle of the, of the forum. People who lost their homes were given the so-called project homes uh, um, that are now sort of prestigious neighborhoods, but they were very much outside of the center back then. And um, here behind this beautiful wall, actually it's not beautiful, but it's interesting. It's a fire breaking wall. There is a neighborhood called uh, Monti that is now quite fancy, shabby, but very fancy. But once upon a time, it was Suburra and the Romans would go to these neighborhoods if they were searching for brothels, for example, and uh, uh, Romans did not spend much time at home. Uh, they would eat in these uh, thermopolia. They were like fast food places. This is from Pompeii because not much is preserved in Rome because people continuously lived in Rome. I was just, in, this was recently discovered. I was just there a few, a few, a few days ago and it's really extraordinary. And when I mention brothels, if you're easily impressed and close your eyes for a few seconds, in the brothels, the girls would, well, um, publicize their, their specialties and uh, that didn't, didn't cost much. And uh, it was all legal and licensed. So they were paying, uh, paying taxes. And if you were looking for a brothel, well, there were some cute little indications. Um, I could call that follow your heart or um, 
whatever you see on the floor. And uh, the, the Venus was everywhere because it's fertility and it was uh, celebrated. Romans considered uh, sex the gift of Venus. She's the goddess of actually physical interaction, not so much love, but we like to talk about her as a goddess of love, why not? And um, in the same section, Trajan's markets, uh, second century, we love to say that it was a um, shopping mall, but most likely it was the administrative center of Rome. And once you're there, then this is the view you have of the Piazza Venezia, the central square, the Trajan's column, you go all the way around now to see again what was uh, considered to be again like a shopping area the shops but again most likely the administrative center of Rome with the medieval layers that were built on top what you see is the result of the excavations and knocking down of the of the old neighborhood and inside there is a fascinating museum this is the well, the medieval well, it's uh, like a monastery built on top. And uh, uh, when you walk around this uh, uh, huge cylinder, basically you're walking where the water was and uh, the square holes make the water circulate and, and get gets cleaned. So we're right di directly in, uh, in the medieval uh, well without water, rainwater. And Talking about the Trajan's column, how would Romans uh, find out what was going on in the empire? Well, there were these columns that were telling them the story. This one, namely, is the story about Emperor Trajan uh, conquering nowadays Romania uh, across, the, across the Danube. And 2,500 little people are going into the war, defeating the enemies, coming back in a triumphal procession with the help of gods, uh, the whole story is there. So news, we have our columns in ancient Rome. And what would Rome be without visiting the Colosseum for which uh, the tickets were distributed by the local authorities and uh, the gladiators were trained in these uh, uh, schools. Here we see the, the ruins of the so-called Ludus Magnum again, where the gladiators uh, are trained and then they would uh, go to the Colosseum to, to fight. So of course, Colosseum requires a whole tour in, in itself. The show would last um, all day and um, it would start with uh, the hunting and uh, the, the beast between themselves, um, acrobats, uh, then uh, during the lunchtime, some executions and uh, the famous gladiators in the afternoon. And uh, it was all happening on the arena of which only one small part uh, was reconstructed. Here you see it uh, on, the, on the right hand side. Right here we see these people. And all these tunnels are the famous uh, underground of the Colosseum where this whole show was uh, prepared. And the halls remain from the Middle Ages when people lived here and they would attach the, the structures, the shelters, the castles. Uh, there was a 12th century castle in the, in the Colosseum. They removed the iron clamps to melt them down. You see here in the center, the iron clamps secured the blocks instead of using mortar. And they were tying the little animals in the Middle Ages. You see where I'm putting my little fingers inside. That's not ancient Roman, that's, um, that's medieval. And talking about the customs and, uh, and folklore, we could say that we have been writing on the walls since the times we lived in the, in the caves and that's called petroglyphs. But here are some graffiti before the cleaning. I took some pictures a long time ago. And Vindicomus could have been a name of a famous uh, uh, gladiator, the revengeful one. And that is how they look today, cleaned. I actually prefer them dirty, but we shouldn't say that. We, we all, well, I wasn't, maybe I was, maybe I was touching. So we leave them, uh, the fat, the grease from our fingers, from our skin on the, on the marble, which absorbs it. And from the Colosseum, you see uh, the third arch that I mentioned. This is the Arch of Constantine, celebrating coming into power, completion of the aqueducts, uh, and uh, this is a pure marketing because none of these 
uh, medallions uh, were actually uh, reliefs that were made for this arch, but they were taken from the monuments of the previous good emperors, and it was a clear message that he was the continuation. Sorry about that. That he was the continuation of the good uh, good emperors, the emperor who legalized uh, Christianity. Talking about the Christianity. Here is the Castel Sant'Angelo that was originally, um, this is a true historical cake, uh, ancient uh, um, uh, mausoleum of Emperor Hadrian, later the, the papal fortress. But this bridge became the bridge for the pilgrims on the way to St. Peter's Basilica. And uh, it famously or infamously collapsed on one occasion in 1450 for a big jubilee here, talked about the jubilees during the presentation on the pilgrimages and about more than 170 people died because it just balustrade uh, broke off and then they enlarged it and made it more, more secure. But now these angels were designed by Bernini much, much later, but this bridge has been there since the second century. And a lot of history is visible, archeology span is visible everywhere. This is Piazza Navona that was, um, built on top of ancient Roman uh, stadium. You can see beautiful, famous um, fountains and the peculiar shape of the square reveals the shape uh, of the stadium. You see in the middle of the, um, of the square, there is a famous fountain by Bernini. I had to mention it with a fake um, uh, obelisk fake in a sense, it's a 2000 years old knockoff, but it's not Egyptian, it's ancient Roman. And there's a little museum, archeological museum here that shows uh, the past of Piazza Navona, showing us one of the arches uh, of the stadium that it once upon a time used to be. And in Piazza Navona, there's another trace of more recent history. This pillar was found uh, in, uh, um, 1933 and what you see scraped out in at the bottom it says the year 11 of something ef era fascista during the fascist era and here i have to mention just briefly with nina we were talking about um what else shall we be preparing for presentations and i have to tell you i have like three things cooking one is literally food uh italian food based mainly about rome the mussolini or fascist rationalist uh, architecture and Naples, which I which I adore. So, um, if you have any any desires out of these three for now, uh, both just um, in your feedbacks, please um, let us know. Let us know. And uh, what would archaeology be in Rome without the Pantheon? We talked about it in other presentations. I just had to show it. Uh, this incredible temple. This is not just archaeology, this is now archaeoastronomy because you see the, the big opening, the oculus in the middle of the, of the Pantheon is actually a sundial. And uh, we could um, tell the time on, on, a sunny, on a sunny day and time of the year as well, depending on where the sun is positioned. And it used to be on a few steps, but now it's all down in the layers of um, uh, history that have accumulated on top of the previous ones. And we have to mention again the, the baths. Uh, the baths of Caracalla, these are from the third century and uh, they're all in ruins. It's a great archeological site. The baths uh, where, where people would go to socialize, uh, uh, to meet their clients, friends, uh, um, hygiene was uh, very highly uh, appreciated in the, in the Roman world. They didn't know about bacteria, but however, they, they used to wash um, a lot and uh, the baths of Caracalla are extraordinary uh, site and some of the remains can be seen on the streets of Rome this was uh, like um, like a fountain which inspired our later um, bathtubs it's in front of the Palazzo Farnese because it was um, found during the papacy of the Pope uh, Farnese more things from those baths ended up around Rome. This is the Basilica of Santa Maria in Trastevere, where you see these uh, gorgeous columns 
they came from the, the, the baths of Caracalla in the 13th century. The Pope used them to build these naves and that's how the Christianity takes over, Christianizes with a bit of holy water, Christianizes the, the pagan remains that testify to um, the glory of Rome and ancient, ancient marble used uh, to embellish the, the floors in Rome. That was a typical medieval fashion. And uh, the Baths of Caracalla um, are the only ones that sur survive in such, such a big uh, um, setting. But other set of baths, the Baths of Diocletian, were turned partly into a uh, basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli and the Martiri. That's one of my favorite churches, talked a lot about it in my churches of Rome. So this was a calidarium, the hot pool. And then you go through tiepidarium, the tiepid, and then you go into frigidarium, the cold space. And there was also a natatio. Natatio would have been like a swimming pool that Romans did not really uh, swim. Uh, some who were whose job was connected or lived by the sea, they, they would learn how to swim. Some privileged kids were taught how to swim, but normally average Roman, so the, no. So the water was up to the height of the chest. And in those baths that could uh, have 3000 people, there was this huge basilica that Michelangelo fixed up and this amazing archeological museum, the baths of Diocletian, Diocletian, and this is um, my colleagues, this is a night tour, looking at what used to be, it's not, there's no water anymore, but used to be uh, Natatio. And one of the decorations is kind of cute, you know, it's not only a Christian decoration, you know, memento mori, remember your mortal, but also these little skeletons in the Roman baths, reminding you they're more, that you're mortal, but they're actually saying, know thyself. Well, it's a precursor of memento mori. And, all of that was possible because of the aqueducts. This is uh, one of the neighborhoods of Rome where we rarely go with, with tourists, but uh, it is extraordinary, architecturally and archaeologically speaking. Several of the aqueducts uh, are meeting here, uh, and now it's a, it's a busy, busy square, but uh, really a fascinating uh, archaeological site. It's called Porta Maggiore, a great door. It mm, incorporates, again, several aqueducts, Claudius, Vespasian, Titus, and became a gate with uh, Aurelian walls incorporating a tomb as well of a baker from the first century BC. You see the, um, the oven. And um, water was coming from the mountains. There is a great park of the aqueducts in the suburbs of Rome. We love to go there. It's a part of a huge, uh, urban park, which is the biggest urban park of Europe. It's a protected area of about 4,500 hectares, and there is a lot of uh, these sections with the, the aqueducts, but you have to go there. You have to go quite relatively far away in the, in the suburbs. And uh, people who live nearby, uh, it's interesting, you know, how you get used to living with the past. There's an uh, ancient Roman road uh, right by your entrance to your condominium. Water, water, water could be a blessing or it could be a curse. Rome is um, filled with diesel signs showing the levels uh, of, the, of the floods uh, in the past. This one is taller than me and I'm like one meter and 65. So it's above my head and um, this is more or less my eyesight. The last flood, this one at the top in 1870. And talking about the floods, you see again why there are the holes in the, in the bridges to alleviate the, um, the pressure. This is Ponte Sisto, built by the same Pope who built the Sistine Chapel. And this is where you have to cross, well, there are other bridges too, this one's pedestrian, to go, you see the dome of um, St. Peter's and the, and the Vatican on the other side of the, of the Tiber. And, uh, Archaeology, again, a visit would not be complete without these museums that I have to mention, also Palazzo Altems. This altar that is believed to represent the birth of Aphrodite from the, from the sea uh, is allegedly from the 5th century BC. And it's, it's a great museum. Uh, this is one of the striking statues from the 1st century BC, which is a Roman replica of the um, 
of the bronze from the third century BC. So you have all these BC, AD, uh, common era after this, before that. So it's really, really fascinating. It's a great, great museum. And uh, underneath, of course, every building that respects itself has some ancient Roman layers. A visit to Rome would not be complete without the Capitoline Museums. Uh, uh, this is a new hall uh, with the Marcus Aurelius. And in the middle, the statue that you saw on the square is, uh, is a replica. This is the oldest museum ever. It's like 1471 when Pope Sixtus donated the bronze statues of great symbolic value for the people of Rome. This is the she-wolf allegedly. Uh, well, raised the uh, the twins, uh, and there are lots of other stories about, about that. But it's a, it's a lovely lovely story. So she's the symbol of Rome. That's also my my logo. A friend of mine made it for me, the the she wolf with uh, with Romulus and um, and Remus. And I just went the other day with a group of colleagues. We have a lot of these guided tours that we organize for each other, and uh, archaeologists are precious. A new museum, absolutely stunning. Museo Nymfeo uh, Horti, uh, where the gardens of a wealthy senator, then imperial. And if you really want to learn about Roman life, it has these great drawers with, it's all so well translated into English and the remains of food and stuff and the tools. Uh, it's really uh, incredible. And it's not very big, but that's really human size. That's just right. The fragments of life, it's like a showcase uh, with uh, the glass, the bronze objects, um, you name it. It's, it's, all, it's all there and uh, really a great place to visit if you want to learn about how Romans uh, really lived. And um, it's not just about visiting the, the museums. I'm going to take you just boom, like very, very briefly outside of Rome uh, in Ostia Antica in the archeological park where you can see, um, for example, these mills where they used to make the, the flour in between these two um, tough, tough T -U -F -F, blocks. And then uh, the donkeys would, would push or oxen, but mainly donkeys, uh, and they would uh, uh, grind the, uh, the wheat and make the flour. And something, I know I usually end up with food, and this, way, this time I'm going to end up with something completely opposite, but somehow connected. Uh, what we cannot see in Rome because it hasn't been preserved are, well, the public toilets. They're there, they're part of life, and you can see them, they had them everywhere in, in Rome, in the empire, but these are in ancient Ostia, so well preserved and restored, obviously. It was uh, uh, like a communal event to go to the, to the restroom. There are many urinaries on the streets and uh, the urine was used to bleach the stains on the togas because it contains ammonia. But uh, and then the taxes were paid on that. That's why the emperor Vespasian said, money doesn't stink or doesn't smell. It's charging tax on, on urine. But uh, uh, well, let's say more serious, uh, um, things you had to do in the bathroom, you would pay a little bit and uh, you would nicely chat with, with your neighbor. Well, how is your wife, by the way? And um, yeah, that's how the life was. Bathing, going to the bathroom. That was all very, very public. So, oh, there was, there was so much to, uh, to say and there would be for another five presentations or a lifetime or five lifetimes. But um, I hope you, enjoyed it and uh, on my site as you know you can find the ones that we recorded in the past about many uh, subjects uh, and um, well I'm looking forward to being invited again and uh, sharing something else with you something more thank you all thank you Olga thank you thank you Olga this is an um, as ever a very detailed uh, tour and I hope people enjoyed it judging by uh, what they say in the chat they have enjoyed it um, we have a few questions here this is uh, maybe the moment to say I think we are um, beyond our advertised time so um, just to say to everybody who has to leave us at this point thank you for coming and uh, we have a few more events 
on our program um, as part of this folklore festival. There's folk horror on, on screen tomorrow. Um, and then we have um, the House of, of the White Witch with um, Dr. John Callow. That should be very interesting. And finally, next Monday, we finish the festival with um, lodging in Georgian London by the wonderful Gillian Williamson. So I hope you can join us for some more of these. And Olga, you have started, a, um, a, a few people have said, um, one person says they would like to hear all three of those sessions that you mentioned. Okay. Um, so fascist um, architecture in Rome, food, um, that should be. Uh, and the last one was? Naples. Naples, Naples, yes. Um, so let's go. We have a few questions and I hope you're, you're happy to answer them. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Okay. Rambo says, "Is the she wolf statue an original or a replica? Who is the she, sculptor, she, and mm -hmm. what was it made of?" This is a, um, it's it's a controversial statue, and I'll I'll tell you why. It is an original, whatever it is. Now, in Rome, we like to believe it's fifth century BC, and that's what I wrote that it's Etruscan, but. Some, we call them killjoy uh, art historians, are claiming now that it's not really Etruscan, but that it's medieval. And they're judging by the technology that was used because it's made of one piece of bronze and lost wax technique. And it seems that in the fifth century BC, they were, however, more frequently making them uh, jointed, welded. So be it that it's Etruscan 5th century BC or a medieval, it's, it's an original. It's just that the twins were added uh, in the Renaissance in the, in the 15th century. Uh, they were not there originally. They were the part of the reinforcing of the myth about Romulus and Remus. So the twins are Renaissance, but the myth is ancient and the statue is original, whatever that means. Okay, well, that's, that's good enough explanation so nothing is is really as it seems at first glance um, melissa says chiaroscuro used so well to create depth and dimension in mosaics at the beginning you you showed some lovely mosaics um so you can maybe explain to people what, what chiaroscuro is Yes, uh, chiaroscuro uh, is a technique that comes from Italian chiaro, light, and scuro, dark. So uh, it was applied in the Renaissance after the Middle Ages when the art was influenced by uh, Byzantine art, which looks very, very orthodox because that's where the Orthodox Church was, uh, uh, was strong. And then a lot of artists came to Europe and influenced the art in Europe. It wasn't until the 13, 1400s, Giotto was among the, the pioneers, actually he was a pioneer, and Masaccio, a very young artist, very young because he died young, uh, 27, started uh, painting, for example, if he wanted to paint a curved object, he started applying a darker on the side. So chiaroscuro is uh, a contrast between light and dark, it's creating volume. Literally, again, light, uh, dark. There is a sfumato, which is more like a smoky, what Leonardo would, uh, uh, would do. And, but the, the artist I mentioned, Apollodorus, uh, it's called uh, Apollodorus, like Apollo, Apollodorus. Uh, he invented this, it's called schia, schiagrafia. I know it in, in Italian. I honestly don't know how to pronounce it in English. Are you there, Nina? Yes, yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, sorry, talking. something jumped on my computer. Um, so that was a technique. You saw those little, little shells that were given the volume by putting the lighter uh, tiles on top and then darker on the side. So it's fifth century BC. It's just exactly. that that technique was given the name chiaroscuro in the Renaissance. I think that's what Melissa was referring to, how they managed to achieve chiaroscuro on, on with with mosaics you know it's you expect it in painting perhaps but not so much to, done in in, in stone no, uh, people, yeah people loved your 360s by the way a couple of them are saying that um so the the panoramic little films that you had okay, okay. um 
Emsa says Orti is allotments. I don't know where you mentioned Orti. You have you Orti Orti O R T I is from Horti, like horticulture. It means a garden. In, in mm -hmm. it's from Latin. So Orti uh, literally is uh, is a garden. Horti with H. It's just that uh, in, in Italian you don't pronounce H, so it's Orti. Yes, in Italian, H is never pronounced at the beginning of the word, but it often appears, which really baffles me. But uh, does it does it have an influence on how a word is pronounced that has it at the it beginning? It does. It does after C and G. So, for mm -hmm. example, you wouldn't pr pronounce, just think of Chianti. Mm -hmm. If it you were not for H, it would be Chianti. Yeah, okay. So it makes C become K, in front of I and E. So che cosa is what. We may no. even do a little, little Italian, basic Italian, uh, combined <laughs> with um, hand, uh, like little hand gestures that Italians use a lot. Uh, well, but that's another idea for a presentation in the future, if, if anyone is interested. And um, yes, H changes the pronunciation of, uh, of C and, oh, and, uh, and G. Um, okay, um, a lot of people were intrigued with your pictures of that Roman road which showed the grooves via which the, the carts were meant to be passing. People were worried how, how did they manage to hit the grooves every time? Was uh, Sally wants to know, so were the carts a standard size? Yes. What yes. Were things like that standardized? Can you yes. tell us a bit more about things like that, like in the Roman times. So were yes, many standard, like that. standard and uh, um, also, for example, the, uh, the width of the modern railways was based on some ancient Roman uh, measures and their regular roads would have been wide enough for, for two cars to pass by. But in Pompeii, the picture I took in Pompeii, you saw where they're only in, in, one, in one direction. And uh, uh, they would always, you just have to become good at that and always go in between those blocks that people used again to jump and cross the street and not uh, uh, wet their feet. Uh, there, the streets would not be actually uh, um, that wet or covered with so much mud or water because they had the shape of the so-called donkey back, which is slightly curved so that it drains uh, um, automatically. And uh, uh, the roads were built uh, um, in layers, which in, in Latin is uh, strata. And strata is in the origin of the word street. So they would dig until they reached the hard rock, and then they would put uh, the layers of uh, uh, sand, uh, uh, lime, uh, crushed clay, uh, and, they, and then on top, the basalt blocks, and there were even the, the slaves whose job it was to walk on these blocks and make sure that they fit perfectly and that they're, they're even. But even though basalt is a very hard rock, it's petrified lava, it still wears off. So you can see those traces of the, the grooves of the, of the wheels of the, of the carriages, which in Rome were repositioned, we cannot say randomly, but at best they could because it was all messed up. While Pompeii, about which I don't bear doing the presentation, even Naples, I'll just do from my heart. I have like thousand photos of, of Naples, but I would never ever pretend to, to be like a local guide there because there's so much, so much to know. And um, so the Roman roads there are preserved because Pompeii, as uh, Wolfgang Goethe said, never a disaster gave us gave so much delight to future generations so if you really want to learn about uh, ancient rome go to pompeii in in rome we have lived on this for 2000 years and we recycled just about anything we could find in in pompeii it was all frozen in time it's a bit of an oxymoron of a sort you know frozen by a volcano but yes so if you yeah. want to learn and roads were absolutely romans did not invent anything except for the um, condominium building, the insula. Everything else they learned from other civilizations and perfectioned. Perfectioned to the level that was probably never seen uh, before. So the Persians had the so-called golden road about which they learned and then cre they created 
the system of, of roads. Uh, ancient Macedonians had a little bit of concrete for the tombs. Romans come up with use of pozzolana, seawater, and we come up with these incredible concrete uh, structures. Uh, uh, glass, Phoenicians were uh, producing glass, Romans start blowing into it or something like that. So all these things, they, they just accumulate from Egyptians, uh, Etruscans, uh, all these civilizations together. And then this absolutely uh, incredible melting pot and influence on, well, all of us, at least in, in the Western hemisphere. Yes, still to this day, somebody anonymously says Roman chariot wheels were mandated to be four feet, eight and a half inches apart. Same gauge as many modern railroads. So yes. it, we, we follow. I think where I live now, we live along a huge Roman road that led from London down to the coast and beyond. Yeah, um, the, the, their wagons had suspension. I mean, uh, so much, so much was actually lost in the Middle Ages and then and then rediscovered later. And I have to thank that gentleman who, who mentioned that because I forgot the exact number. So I was kind of finding the safe way around it. But yes, we are using all these uh, Roman inven inventions mm -hmm. or perfections from the from the past. So speaking about that, uh, somebody anonymously again, how did the neighborhoods of the imperial times get their water? You mentioned that personal plumbing was something one paid for, but were there public wells or water sites for the insula? Is that how they said apartments? Insula, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, were the fountains originally sites to get water for use? Yes, the insula uh, would have the, the shops and it was usually owned by uh, one person, an investor, and uh, he would have the shops that uh, he was renting at the, at, the, at the ground floor. And then wealthier families were living on the first floor and right above or second, depends in US, it would be first. And then in, in Europe, we, we call that the, uh, the second floor and uh, on the first, sorry, first floor. And then uh, poorer you were, higher you lived because you had to carry all your water up there. Sometimes if you had this privilege from the, from the emperor, if you paid for it, or if you were a meritable citizen, uh, the, the pressure from the aqueducts could bring the water to the level of the ground floor and the first floor, but not higher than that. Mm -hmm. So you were not only in danger of um, fires up, up there, but it was also very dirty because uh, you don't sort of waste water for cleaning. And uh, uh, the water, yes, was brought, Rome, only Rome had 11 aqueducts. And uh, uh, sometimes you see like, for example, for the Palatine Hill, there were several arches on top, like four levels of arches to bring water all the way to the top of the, of the hills where wealthy people uh, lived. And um, the pressure was um, calculated. It's, I think it's 1.5 um, per, uh, percentage of slope because you have to, make water move, but it can't be more than that because it would accelerate and then break something in the long run. If it's less than that, then it slows down and it stagnates. And then it would arrive to a cistern and from the cistern, the water would go up and then it was distributed. And there were more than thousand fountains in, in Rome and still today, there are the famous nazoni, the big noses with a little hole on top and then you press at the bottom and the water comes out and you drink the water perfectly safe public water. And it follows the, the old tradition that water is public and everybody has right to it. And for the bath, uh, everybody could go, even slaves to whom their uh, owners, of course, allowed, allowed to go. And uh, uh, they were not free, but the price was like a cheap bottle of wine or a loaf of bread, it was just like a few coins. So Romans uh, would very gladly go because that's where they spent most of most of their time in the baths. Fantastic! You're having I'm having to get rid of as as I say of a lot of congratulations and brava and bravissima and uh, come sempre ottissima um, <laughs> from Carol Johnson. Um, People are saying that they're very interested to learn more about Mussolini and uh, his architecture and you know, all those, um, was he executed in Rome or? No. No. No, he, he, um, he was, uh, he capitulated, he was imprisoned, taken to a prison in Abruzzo, freed by the German forces, taken to Lago di Garda in the north, where he uh, founded this like a puppet state called Republic of Salò. 
And when uh, the war was over, he tried to escape. Uh, he was he tried to escape to Switzerland with his mistress Claretta Petacci, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he was caught on the Lake of Como by the partisans. And uh, uh, both uh, Mussolini and Claretta were killed at the Lake of Como. And uh, mm, according to the stories, Claretta tried to protect Mussolini with her body, so she was killed as well. And their bodies were taken to Milan and uh, they were hanged uh, um, upside down for their uh, feet, ankles on the Piazzale Loreto in Milan. And I remember the story that one of the, um, Claretta was wearing a skirt and uh, uh, the skirt fell down and revealed her underwear. And uh, um, I remember vaguely the story about this lady who was in a partisan, like communist party, which led the, the resistance. And uh, uh, she went and then if you see the pictures, you will see that her, her skirt is tucked in between her thighs because that was um, uh, a gentle gesture of, um, mm -hmm. of another lady. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of interest and um, uh, quite a few people have said they would love a session on that. I know you were suggesting that at one point and you actually did put in some details in some other presentations you mm -hmm. did. Uh, was it of Borghese that he had his um, somewhere? I remember you showing. He's, he's all, he did so much. Mm. But and, the road uh, you for showed. The good and for the bad. I mean, I'm not going to go into anything political. And even a lot of the things that are attributed to him, he inherited from the previous uh, um, system from the from the kingdom. So he he completed that. So, but again, I'm not going to go into politics because that's a minefield. But uh, about the um, about architecture and and art, sure. I I just I, I love it. I love and it. him as a as a person, like the way he was, I think yes, people are still yes, fascinated. He was an, an no, amazing. No problem to talk about that, but no 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 judging any because in Italy also it's very difficult to ask anyone because you will get such opposite um, inputs. Uh, you. I'll tell you just very briefly, I come from a country and you know Nina, we only learned about the bad side of fascism and I come to Italy as a war refugee 30 years ago and I hear every once in a while some older people saying with nostalgia like ah, when he was around. So I asked an older lady, uh, we're sitting next to her in a cafe and said, and she was talking about Mussolini and she said she was so nostalgic, you know, when he was around, there was some order in this world. I said, okay, so what's that? So I explained to her, you know, they only heard bad things. So how come, you know, she loves him so much. And she told me she was an orphan after the first world war and she would have ended up on the streets uh, as you know, what happens to little girls on the streets. But uh, she was put in an orphanage and given education. So, yeah, yeah, no, I've, when I went to Italy, I think this country uh, where we are, United Kingdom is much less polarized in that sense. Of course, mm -hmm. there's always, you know, right wing, le left wing, but the word fascist doesn't really sound, you know, nobody's going no, it to horrible. It absolutely it. sounds horrible because of politics. I mean, I'm, I'm, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I come from a family that suffered a lot under fascism and Italian mm -hmm. occupation in the Second World War. But especially, you know, my father was imprisoned by, by like, he would have been uh, executed. They falsified his documents. He was only 15. He was in the partisans and he was kept, he was captured by the Italian occupation. And they would have shot him uh, had Mussolini not capitulated and they opened the prisons. And, um, and he survived because there was an older Italian gentleman who gave him his portion of food in the prison. And to, you, you know the place, uh, Lovrenac was a prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's this and that, but again, I'm not. I'm not going to go into politics. God forbid. No, I mean nobody's actually interested in that so much. I think people are interested in your type of looking at buildings, looking at art, looking mm -hmm. at, at things that are still so very much alive in Rome. If you know where very to much. look, that's what's interesting. Yes, um, we are now way beyond time, and I'm really grateful and surprised that so many people are still with us so let me just find a few uh, um, there's a couple of questions although mostly people are congratulating uh, Melissa again says I always thought the whole uh, Vestal Sherelata uh, meaning and penalty was very harsh um, 
I don't know, you, you mentioned Vestal Virgins and their, their um, difficult lives. I mean, I suppose their lives were not that difficult. They probably lived very privileged lives, but could end up as, as um, entombed at any moment. If It was a very cruel death if you broke your vow because uh, they believed uh, superstitiously that you brought a disaster on, on Rome because you were supposed to be, to be pure. So they were, their life was extremely privileged. Of course, if you were happy with uh, uh, being celibate and not ever, well, you could marry after those 30 years. And these ladies were not at that age back then, but it was a question of social prestige to have a Vestal Virgin in your family. So they were gladly in combined marriages after that, but a lot of them would just choose to, to either retire or be in the temple and help other generations. And they had ex very much power in their hands. They could uh, give grace to somebody who was condemned to death and stuff like that. But if they broke the vow, they would bury them in this campus sceleratus with a loaf of bread and a jug of, of water and these ladies would actually die of, of, they would die a natural death because nobody was supposed to spill the blood of a Vestal Virgin. She was so sacred. It didn't happen very frequently, but again, from this location, Campus Sceleratus comes in Rome. You don't hear that so much elsewhere, but uh, uh, una ragazza, a girl, Scelerata, is a girl who doesn't really know what she's doing, so she's doing bad things, but she, it's not always, uh, um, it has this connotation of being innocent but doing bad things because you don't know any better. Because let's, let's face it, these girls were making these vows when they were like six to 10 years old. They didn't probably know what they yes. could expect. I mean, it was, you can imagine, it was just presented to them as the ultimate honor and For the they, family, they weren't it asked. Was yes. The top. Absolutely. Um, there's somebody while you were talking about Mussolini. Um, we've got Gianluigi Riza, who says what you tell us about Mussolini is real and true. I just live not very far away from Como, Lake Como, and I know it. And uh, Nancy says, I knew someone that would say Mussolini made the trains run on time. So it, you're not the only one to have come across this. Um, Lots of thanks again. Let me, somebody, this, let me just get, um, could you advise Naomi, please, could you advise her how she could find out where Severus lived and traveled in Britain, please? Also, she wants to find out about Roman grape wine, wines grown in Britain. Do you know anything about Romans bringing wine to britain and probably yes because it's a, it's a, i don't think it i don't think i don't know but just off the top of my head i would say it doesn't naturally grow in britain because it's more of a mediterranean plant oh, and it yes. must have been brought by by romans but i don't know so i would i would have to check okay i have fine. i have a friend uh, who's a blue badge guide and he lives in in in, in rome i believe Stuart might might know somebody British who's a colleague who knows about Romans. And I have a friend I could ask. I always invite everyone, if you have any questions after the event, please feel free to go to my site, find there is my email, ask me. And whenever I know the answer, of course, I'll, I'll be happy to, to answer. Just to say, I will send Olga's details together with the feedback request at the end of this. And uh, the recording of this event will be on her website tomorrow or the day after. So I'll send you a link to that, that as well to everybody who might want to see it or those who have booked but missed us tonight. OK, so let's finish with. Uh, Maureen's question, can you recommend a more modern written history of Rome to read if you've already read Livy and the others? About ancient Rome, like novels or um, I essays? think she's mentioning Livy, so I think she means ancient Rome. Uh, there's the... Um... Oh my God! There, 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 there are so many. Uh, there's um, the the fall of Rome. Uh, oh, I have them. I have them all here. <laughs> well, <Ooh>. big one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's a, the, the famous fall of Rome, and uh, but that's about the barbarian invasions uh, and. Uh, um, 
I would, I would have to prepare that, you know, right now oh, my, my okay. head, my head is empty. Like I haven't ever read anything. Um, no, come on. I mean, you've just given us an hour and a half of, of beautiful stuff from. And from I don't know. I don't know where to put books anymore. This has just, just <laughs> arrived in, in, in the last week. <laughs> so yes, there would be loads, but uh, um, please send me an email. And I'll be happy to, to share some of these uh, things with you, maybe with, you know, referring to specific, uh, specific periods. Okay, so um, Naomi, now that you- Oh, Suetonius, have... the, 12, the 12 emperors uh, on, yeah, there's, then, you know, I don't know what it says, remains from Pliny, the, the younger who wrote to Tacitus about the notes of his uncle. So please send me an email and um, I'll try to collect myself. And, uh, and give you a decent decent list. That's great, Olga. Don't worry. With um, uh, Naomi does have another request. If you could um, have a talk, this is in future, so you, I don't I won't put you on, on the spot right now. But on Black African Romans, do, have you come across um, people who would be Black Africans who lived in Rome at the time? very, very little information about that. Because mm -hmm. if they lived in ancient Rome, yes, of course, they were, they were, the, uh, um, they were the slaves. As any conquered area, they were the slaves from any nationality that was conquered by the Romans. So uh, not necessarily from, uh, from Africa. But there are, there is, for example, a statue in the Vatican museums of a little boy who was serving in the, um, uh, in the baths and uh, he's got the head that doesn't really belong to that statue is a so-called not pertaining head. And it's the, the head of a, of a black person from, from Africa. Um, it, there is um, a tomb of an ambassador from Congo who died in Rome, but that's a much later history. It's in the uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major. He was the ambassador to the papal states. And uh, uh, for example, a lot of the the Christianity makes referrals with the like little places of black uh, people. For example, the, the coat of arms of the Pope uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, Pope uh, Papa uh, Pope uh, um, Papa Ratzinger, mm -hmm. um, whom now that now that it came out, we, we nicknamed the Pope the Pope Papa Razzi. He was Ratzinger and he was the Pope. So Papa Razzi, Papa Razzi, or Pope Ratzinger, Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, the Pope Emeritus, uh, uh, in his coat of arms. He has like a little black person because they're referred to like as a three magi. Mm -hmm. But that I really have not severus. gone into, into information about uh, uh, black people coming in Rome. And I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. It's just that, that I Severus have... was a black African. Yeah, um... they were from Libya. They were from Libya. Yeah, well, so were they really uh... black? I mean, so like, that, like, I mean, they were Africa. It doesn't matter. It's, oh, from Syria, it's sorry, Africa. yeah. So yeah. Um, I don't think they were ethnically black, black. They were darker, absolutely. But um, no, I don't but from think, Africa. From, from, yeah. Well, from that's, Syria, that's... my God, now, yeah. But um, even, you know, like Egyptians, mm -hmm. they, they, they had these uh, uh, black African roots. But I, I, yeah. try, I, I haven't come across much of that mm -hmm. and uh, I, I wouldn't try to say something that I'm not certain about I would have to do no, some of course we research. can't tease you on that and as I said especially not after an hour and a half thank you you've given us much more than than I uh, than than we asked for somebody says what a fabulous necklace what is that on your necklace it's David David who there is this I, I I'm, I'm not a publicity. I'm not an influencer, obviously, but <laughs> I have a collection of these. I, I never wear them, actually, just occasionally, like, okay, so I'll put something. But I just love them so much. The designer's name is Angela Caputi. Uh -huh. And when I was working as a tour manager, I would go to Milan frequently, and there was a shop there. She also has a shop in Florence, and there are a couple of shops in Rome that sell her necklaces. Uh -huh. It's like expensive bijou. And uh, this is an old collection. She doesn't make ever the same things. And uh, this is David. This is little head of David. Oh, how wonderful. That's great. She did so, Buddha things and she did all kinds of stuff like that. Well, it, it got you noticed, Olga. Um, so listen, I think um, 
it's time to say good night to everybody who's joined us tonight. Buona notte. And, and thank you so much, Olga. Um, we are now all hoping for these sessions. A lot of people voted for Naples as well. Um, so there you go. Um, everybody, good night. Thank you so much for coming. Olga, thank you. And um, I can't wait to, to, to see you in a program, uh, program again. So I'll let you say good night. Good night, buona notte, grazie. And good night from me, everyone. See you again. Good night.